it was interesting. Like they would say, nope, we gotta do that again. And it felt really great playing, but I had rotated somehow or shifted yeah, my weight. Or... Get too close or too far from the microphone. Today's episode is a special treat. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Jack Unziker and Martha Walford, who have recently released an album of duos for violin and bass. It's titled The Diaries of Adam and Eve. That's the name of one of the pieces by Michael Doherty, actually. Super cool. We talk about how they commissioned Michael Doherty and all the other people that wrote for this album. We've got links so you can check it out anywhere that you listen to music. Jack's a past podcast guest. Had him on in 20. 17. It was great to chat with him and with Martha for this episode. Quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Modacity, Colstein Music, A440, and Encoda. More on them later. And you'll be hearing some tracks throughout from this album, which I can't recommend highly enough. Definitely check out the album and enjoy this conversation with Jack and Martha. I, it was fun to go back and listen to this album because I've heard much of it, if not all of it. I remember hearing uh, in, was it uh, 2017 down in South Texas at George's uh, Viva El Bajo? You played a yeah. lot of it, didn't you? Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, we played a lot of it there. We did the Doherty. Yeah, right? we did the Doherty and we did... And the Chave, I think. Well, we had a full recital, so I don't think we played everything, but we played a lot of it. I definitely uh, heard some of Tom's duos, yeah, and and I yeah. heard the Doherty, and I think, if I remember mm-hmm. right, you two narrated the respective yeah. parts, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. When it was fun to read through the the notes on yeah. Michael's site, and so it, it sounds so. I've heard it with you two doing it. The CD doesn't have the narration just because the CD's long anyway. I, you know, I just to fit it on, I'm sure. Um, but then have you done it with actors ever? Or has it always been the two of you doing the narration? We've done it a couple of times with other people narrating it. Um, like if we're at a festival or something. We did it at a festival in Michigan. And we had the male-female co-directors do the narration. Um, but when we were in Costa Rica... We, um, we got a colleague of ours at the university to do the translation into Spanish and she, um, we sent it down there and they, I mean, they went all out, got the theater department involved and I mean, it was like a staged production and yeah, they had two actors come out and I mean, they really, I mean, they went, really went into it. It was pretty amazing. I think there's a video on, there on YouTube there somewhere. Oh, I am tracking that video down and, and, and listening to it. I can't, I can't wait to check that out. <laughs> We had to be like, no, 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 you got to tone this yeah. down a little bit. <laughs> keep, keep, more of your, keep more of your clothes on when yeah. we actually do this in front of the audience. But there's a picture of us with a, a guy with his shirt off. And yeah, and if, if you just look through our photos, all of a sudden it's just like, what? what is that one? Like, it looks like we did a recital at a toga party. Yeah. Wow. But, but yeah, it, it's, um, it, it opens, it, it lends itself well to that about getting other people involved in the community and, you know, putting them putting them out there to, to speak as long as you have a male and a female to play those two parts. It's, it works really well. And we've done it enough that, um, that we, we have our own little way of, of saying it, but every time we get somebody else to read through it, it's always takes on a slightly different shape. And, uh, when we premiered the piece, uh, when Michael Doherty came down to Texas, we had two of our uh, vocal faculty from the university say the parts live. And then when we did the recording, we had them do the recorded as well. So we have that in the can, and we hope to do a you know bigger release later in the future that includes the narration, maybe uh, another, like extended two CD set or, or just well, to do something. Doherty was talking about a YouTube Yeah, just doing it on YouTube and just adding the narration so you can hear it. With professionals. <laughs> well, I, I can't wait for that. And it was it was so fun uh, to go back. I was ju- I was actually just this this moment listening through the album uh, on Apple Music, and I remember hearing it down in Texas. And I think I, I you played it at the ISB convention or some some of this in 2017 at least. I think. But mm-hmm. um, when I Michael Doherty is one of my favorite contemporary composers, and when I think Michael Doherty, I think I think groovy is like one of the first words mm-hmm. that comes to mind. <laughs> um, back when I was teaching high school, I 
did strut for strings, I think uh, way too many times. I did it probably three or four <laughs> times. It was like the perfect, like good high school orchestra piece. It was just so great. And I hear some of those Doherty grooves in this. And obviously there are lots of moods and, and, uh-huh. and but it's, it's just, it's so cool. Maybe we could dig into like, how the heck did you get... Michael Doherty to write a piece for violin and double bass. First of all, thank you <laughs> for doing that. Uh, and then get, just t- uh, uh, either or both of you, just tell tell me, uh, us, I guess, how that unfolded. Well, we can start with, uh, at the very beginning, we started playing music that was pre-existing for violin and double bass. And then we started branching out into transcribing works for violin and double bass. Um, and then... We had one of our faculty, George Chave, um, write us a, a set of duos, and they're they're on the the disc. They're the last piece on the disc. So that was the first one that was written specifically for us, and then that just sparked an interest in creating new repertoire. And then I'll let Martha take over about how she contacted Michael. Well, I knew him in graduate school. He's got a piece for violin and wind ensemble mm-hmm. called "Ladder to the Moon." Um, and he would hire graduate students to come and play through stuff that he'd written and talk about, um, you know, accessibility on the instrument. How did it feel? What's comfortable? He'd have us just experiment with things. And he was doing that even with the duos days before the premiere. He'd say, I don't really like that. Would you try this? And then he would ask us, okay, now what did you do? And, you know, Tell me, tell me what works, what doesn't. And so he's a great composer in that regard because he he's smart. He wants to write music that, that sounds good on the instrument, that feels comfortable to play, and that I think draws out the unique characteristics of the instrument. So he would hire grad students to come to his house and help with that. And so I helped on that piece. And um, so when we started commissioning, I just had this in my mind that I really would like him to write his piece. And it took several years of back and forth and concept and what would we like for him to settle on something and mm-hmm. agree to do it. Well, so that, that, I was curious about that. Like, how do, um, how many parameters for Michael or I guess anybody, did you, I mean, do you just say, hey, write a piece? Or did you say, we've got this idea for Adam and Eve? Maybe we could just, with Michael's piece specifically, like, how that, it's a, you know, how'd that idea come to be? <laughs> well, he started down a different track um, uh, with magicians. He had something in mind about magicians originally, and then he came across this, this novella by Mark Twain called The Diaries of Adam and Eve. And he scrapped the first piece and said, this is what I want to write for this this married couple, this male-female couple. This just fits perfectly. And it's, uh, you know, Michael Doherty's association with Americana and trying to draw from so many different aspects of American culture. And so Mark Twain fits perfectly into that for him. And um, Well, he wanted percussion, too. Yeah. And in terms yeah. of parameters, we our only hard parameter was it had to be violin and bass with no other instruments because we wanted to take the show on the road and travel and both being at university this was a way for us to do it without requiring another person to make a project happen or a recital or whatever so that was our only stipulation and so he first wanted percussion and then he asked how we felt about um multimedia yeah multimedia using visual imagery and and our hall is not set up for that so we we requested that we not go down that path. And he came across, I'd never heard of the novella before, but that was his idea. Usually when we address the composers or when we're starting a conversation and they say, well, what, what sort of thing do you have in mind? And so we would say, well, we want, we're talking to Dory, we want it to sound like Michael Dory. We want to, you know, Tom and Nipic, he has the same thing, you know, what are you, what are you interested in? And we try to just let them, let them take it where they are, you know, and we didn't share a lot of the recordings that we had already. We didn't want to like kind of influence, you know, make it not like this or, and it ended up working out really well. Like all the pieces are very, very different and they use the two instruments very differently. I remember Andrew Clearfield asking us if we were comfortable with sort of extra <clears throat> effects. I don't know if that's quite the right word, but you know, tapping and hitting the instrument and Jack was fine with it. And I, I wasn't comfortable with that. So, you know, she, she also got really into color and just trying to draw out all the unique sounds for the instruments. But there are places where Jack is hitting and tapping and 
you know, the Doherty's using a drumstick at one point. So... Yeah, I was thinking about, uh, I, I, you know, my mind, I think, oh, there's a lot of rep written for violin and bass. I mean, it's a great combo. But then I was thinking back, like, how often have I actually just played with violin? And it's like disturbingly little. I mean, I think I played the Bottazzini duo that one of those, you know, uh, fun, quasi goofy things uh, with with uh, orchestra, I think, back in college. I'm, I'm trying to think if I ever there is is there not a lot of rep rep? Uh, Tell me just about rep for violin and bass. It's such a great combination, and it, it must be. Maybe we could start with. Okay, so my wife is a harpist, a doctor now, but a harpist, and it's always been interesting uh, being married to someone that you make music with. Um, how how did you? When did you start playing together? Let's talk about that first. I, okay. <laughs> Together. Well, I was already teaching at the university um, for a year before Martha started teaching there. Um, and during the summer before Martha uh, and I met, she came down to Texas and started teaching summer classes. And we actually met at the airport. We met at DFW Airport on our way to Costa Rica. We had both been recommended to play in a, a festival with a, a small uh, string ensemble, so one bass, and I think it was 13 or 14 strings total. And we got to tour Costa Rica for three weeks and um, played much of that that small chamber string rep. And we really got to know each other because we both get car sick. And we had to drive all over the country in these twisty mountain roads. And so we would sit right in front of our tour bus, right with the big windshield in front of us, and just talk for two, three, four hour trips. And um, yeah, so that's how we met and how we started playing together our first solo thing we played together was on that trip where we did the Serenata Nocturna by Mozart and it has two violins and solo bass right in front of the, in front of the orchestra and yeah I think the next thing we did was the Bottasini Grand Duo <laughs> with orchestra no we we <laughs> oh, did yeah, was, the, we did a two part conventions yeah we wanted to <clears throat> play a recital together and wanted to travel and so we I think we were going up to Michigan and we played in Kansas and so we started to scour the rep, and there is there is great rep that's pre-existing for violin and bass, um, but we we didn't stumble on maybe the the gems right away. So mm -hmm. we, we did a number of transcriptions, and we, um, we played some pieces just once. <laughs> yeah. we transcribed a bunch of piano rep. Yeah, so, um, so those those that are interested in this this music, um, we started you know with like the Bach two part inventions. Then we did a lot of Frank Proto's transcriptions. We did the Glear Suite and the Beethoven Sonata, Avogadro, Eyeglasses, and the Mozart Duo in G Major. These are all Frank Proto's um, arrangements. And then we did some some of our own transcriptions like Leclerc. And, yeah, our stuff Leclerc. was not, not very successful, but we <laughs> well, we. We did the Clearfield. We did a yes, wonderful we did. transcription of the Pablo Neruda songs based on poetry of Pablo Neruda. And that was based in oboe. Yeah. And we did our own transcription, and she found us, actually. Um, she must have seen her name pop up on a, a Google search or something, and she wrote us and, and asked, if, I don't know if she asked for a copy of the program or asked if we had gotten her transcription for violin and bass, which we didn't know existed. So that's how we got to know her and connected in that way. Mm -hmm. So we, we commissioned her at that point to write us a piece. Yes, we love the Pablo Neruda songs, really atmospheric piece, um, really moody, mm -hmm. and her, her stuff is just great in that regard. It really sets a, a particular environment. It's really special. <laughs> I have been a fan of A440 Violin Shop for years and years, and I logged on recently to their website, a440violinshop.com, and whoa, totally new redesigned. It is absolutely beautiful. You can reach out to them on the website. They've got beautiful, buttery double bass photos right up front. And whether it's a bass or a bow or some work on your instrument, repairs, or restoration, A440 has you covered. I have been going to that shop since the 90s and I've never been let down. 
Check out their website, a440violinshop.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers. And they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs and superior restorations at affordable prices. They're always happy to assess bases for trade-in, consignment, or even purchasing outright. Contact them to schedule a time to discuss your base and your future needs. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BaseViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Jory Herman and I'm one of the newest members of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Double Bass Section. Last year I began using the Diodario Kaplan strings and really love how they sound and what they can do. As a young bassist, my first memories of playing the instrument were actually on the Diodario Helicor strings, so you could say that I've been using Diodario products since about 1994. Throughout college and my early professional life, I tried many different types and gauges of strings, and even experimented with mixing and matching from different sets. I would put three strings from one set with the lowest string from another, or maybe just change out the top string or do half and half, but never was really fully committed to the entire set from a single brand. Kaplan strings, however, do everything that you need them to. They have a crisp articulation while remaining warm and resonant from top to bottom across all strings. They have an immediate and clear response without maxing out in the loudest section of the music, all while still being delicate and singing in the softest sections of the music. All around, they're an incredible set of strings for the orchestra bass section. Samuel Colstein, who founded Colstein and Sons back 70 years ago at this point, Sam was largely self taught. Here's Barry Colstein about how his father got into the business. You know, it was mainly self taught, yeah. but, but he, I will pay homage to people that need to be paid homage. He did study a bit with Al Eisenstein, who was a great repairman in Manhattan. He was considered one of the top. And Al was very gracious. He allowed my father to sit at his side, watch him work but a lot of it was self-taught my father was very ing ingenious person he really would look at a problem and figure out five ways of, of doing it and then choose the right way always Ever since those early years, Colstein and Sons has been working to solve problems for bass players, provide them with ever better instruments and new opportunities in terms of travel bases and cases and all sorts of things that we need as bass players. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Colstein, for everything that you do and for sponsoring the podcast. So, so, so you've been you've been collaborating since you met, basically. Yeah, like music's been music's been a part of the journey the whole way. Okay, that's very that's very cool. And I, I like I, for example, I had no idea that Mozart wrote something for two violins and bass. That's I'll have to I'll have to look that up. Um, any other any other uh, uh, big names like Mozart <laughs> that that wrote for vi violin and bass? Like did Haydn didn't do anything? Did he? Are there any other composers that just randomly put out mm -hmm. something? Well, uh, Edgar Meyer's got a great duo for violin bass that was um, published. I think it was like in Double Bass magazine or yeah. One, one of... Isn't that also did did Mark O'Connor maybe publish that or something? Because there is a published there is a published version of of violin one of his violin and bass pieces, right? Am I am I right on that? I I'm I'm trying to remember where. Where the music, where the who published it, or where where it came from, I could I could look it up. I, I think at least maybe maybe it's changed, but I think at present because I I remember I just heard that uh, in in Australia, and I thought, and I, I remember before most people had tried to transcribe uh, what Edgar did because Edgar usually the the rule of thumb was like I don't publish my stuff, but if you find it, I'll I'll give you tips on what what is and isn't you know accurate. And I remember listening to this thing in Australia, and I thought. There's no way that they transcribed. It was just like too massive. Um, and so, but, but that is that I, I believe that that duo is available somewhere anyway. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it has been published. It's one of the few things that yeah. it was published. Because he, I, I asked him about that, and he said that, well, to be frankly honest with you, I, I, I want the gigs. I want the work. I want if they want to play my music. I want to be the one that plays it. And I was like, that's that's fair enough. And I also thought, you know, that's very silly coming from Edgar Meyer, like who have all the bass players. He's the last one that needs to be protected. If they want Edgar Meyer, you know, they go with Edgar Meyer. But, <laughs> There's the, a new piece by uh, Penderecki that um, that we heard Sam Suggs play in the competition, the Radish competition, with great showmanship. And you remember how it started with the violinist was out in the audience, and it just segued from a previous piece, and the violinist just started playing instead of it came out on stage. Awesome piece. The Ranch Brown. Uh, yeah, there's the Ranch Brown duo that was written for Eugene Levinson and Gary Levinson. They recorded that piece, and uh, yeah, we played that early in our. It's a great piece. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a canon, basically. Um, and let's see, Andre Previn wrote a duo recently. Um, there's a, a great one by Mortari uh, that was written for Petraki. That's a three movement, really great you know, piece. Of, there's a wonderful recording of uh, Daniel Marie. That's a a great one. We played a, a piece by an American composer um, called Pistol Pete's Pasacalia that, that was written for George Speed um, and uh, Michael D'Ambrosio was that composer and it's a really fun piece as well. Um, what else? What else is out there? Oh, that actually is a good segue into what our next project is. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, what, what's, uh, what's, what's in the pipeline? So we want to continue with this, obviously. It's been a really wonderful experience. And um, so while we're in the process of commissioning um, more pieces for bass and violin, we want to go back and, and do a, a recording in the meantime of pre-existing work. So we're exploring things that are already written for violin, maybe not commissioned by us, but... Um, the commissioning process just takes so long. I mean, it takes a long time to get the pieces and workshop them and mm -hmm. perform them. Yeah, we want to perform them a lot before we take them into the studio. And uh, there's the whole fundraising aspect of it too, because <laughs> composers need to make a living. And um, yeah, so that's 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 why I have all these pieces on the tip of my tongue. There are a lot of things that I'd like us to. Play well, and it's great. Play. It's great for things that have been commissioned because you don't. No composer, I, I imagine, wants to write something that's performed once, right? So it's great that you can give, you know, give uh, another, uh, you know, interpretation and perf and multiple performances of these pieces. Um, and and you know, I, it makes total sense to want to workshop them and and try them out and road test them before you take them into the studio. Um, what was the recording process like? Actually, getting into the studio and recording this. Uh, how 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 long did it take? Was it like over a long period of time to just go in and bang it out over a few days, or what? What, what was that? What was the genesis of the album like? It was the, the latter. It was going and banging it out after, in a couple of days. So I think we, um, we had three days. Yeah, we planned it out so that our kids were back in school, and we and UTA <laughs> UTR on the University we teach at was not yet back in, in school, so it was right at the end. This of very small Christmas window. Christmas break. <laughs> So that we could go and basically drop the kids off at school, and go record, and uh, either one of us would go pick up the kids, and the other would play the solo movements that we had to record. And and uh, but yeah, we basically ran in and did it really quickly. Um, we learned a lot. Yeah, it was very educational. Like, <laughs> next time we do it, we'll we'll have some other things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll any any, <laughs> any advice for people who are about to go? <clears throat> into the studio uh, and record something that what, what, tune what all the time, tune all the time. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. check the metronome markings. Cause we would go back and, and at the end of the day, listen and realize we needed to touch up a spot here or there. And you know, your sense of tempo at four in the afternoon versus nine 30 in the morning mm -hmm. is different. And so we would get these takes that sounded great. And then we'd go to splice stuff and we just couldn't use it because yeah. it wasn't even close for tempo. You know, and even just a little bit yeah. off would sound really weird. So, yeah, and, and open strings, you know, they, they just would get, they would go a little bit lower as you kept playing. Rehear your bow. Yeah, that was that was one that, that's a story I tell my students all the time. <laughs> so I was like, I needed to rehear for about two months and I just couldn't get, I couldn't be without the bow. And, and so the recording day came and there it is. So listening to it, I, you know, I wince all the time and say, hear all these things that I know wouldn't be there. You got to rehear, but uh, yeah. And uh, 
you know, we're fortunate. We have a, a very nice recording studio at the university, and so our thought about doing the next recording is that maybe we won't try to get all of the repertoire ready at the same time, and then we'll learn a piece and, with it and play that piece of the bunch, and then go in and just record that, and then move on to the next thing. So It was hard for me <clears throat> in the studio because I had to be more still than I used to be when I play. And they had us sit on stools because even just the slightest rotation or or shifting of weight would send the sound, I don't understand all this, but into the microphones in different ways. And they had different kinds of microphones in different locations. And it, it was interesting. Like They would say, nope, we've got to do that again. And it felt really great playing, but I had rotated somehow or shifted yeah, my weight. Or, get too close or too far from the microphone. And I was playing off paper at that point. And so I'd have several pages spread out and I couldn't kind of move along like the typewriter effect with the music. And that that took some getting used to. Yeah, we usually play very close together as well when we're on stage and, and uh, have a lot of communication in all different ways, visual and, uh, and being able to hear each other really well. And then you get in the studio and you get isolated and you're on basically opposite sides of the room. And, um, you know, listening to this recording, there's a, there's a lot of groove stuff like in the Doherty, but there's also a lot of push and pull throughout. Like a lot of the composers uh, wanted a ton of that. It's written in to, to move forward in the Chalorando figures. And, and so that's a challenge when you get much further apart physically than, than you're used to being. There is this mode in my practicing app, Modacity, which I totally love. It's called Deliberate Practice, and it's such a cool feature. Here's Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelfo on how this works. One of my pain points as a musician was like not really having a method to generate reliable improvement. And Deliberate Practice is like the scientific method for music practice. So what you do is you identify the one thing that you want to improve, be it articulation, intonation, emotion, comfort, whatever it is you want to improve, and brainstorm or choose one of the pre-suggested strategies for that area of improvement, and then test it out. Record yourself trying that strategy, listen back, and press yes, it worked, or no, it didn't work to create that improvement. It's such a clean way of tracking your progress. I do it every day, and it has done wonders for my bass playing and just my overall enthusiasm for music. you got to check it out. Modacity.co is the site, and if you go to our site, you can click through it and get a special offer for lifetime access for this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. This episode is brought to you by Encoda. By the way, that's spelled N-K-O-D-A. This app is like Netflix or Spotify for sheet music, and they are working with over 100 of the major publishers like Boozy and Hawks, Baron Writer, and more to provide sheet music on your device. I have an iPad Pro, but this also works on Android, and I have so many pieces from Encoda loaded up on it. I have all the Beethoven symphonies and their scores. I'm circling things. I'm flipping between the score and the part to show students. I totally love this app, and people like Sir Simon Rattle are singing its praises. It really is the next thing for musicians. It's a subscription service and you can download Encoda from your app store today for a free trial. That's N-K-O-D-A. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve travels far and wide here in the Western United States. Here's Steve on where he goes and what some of the benefits of being able to travel like that are. You travel uh, with it. You're going yeah. up to Oregon. You're going up to Seattle. Up to Seattle. Yeah. You know, yeah. and back, you know, out to Arizona, you know, wherever people want to see a selection, they don't have options. Or if I have a line on some basis I want to check out and maybe buy or trade, you know, I have the option. That's, that's the beauty of me not being tied to a workbench in a shop. Steve works with some of the San Francisco Bay Area's best professional bass luthiers, people like Nathaniel Rich, Alex Friedman, and many others to get basses 
playing beautifully. When someone comes to me asking where to look for a bass, whether they're a student or professional or they're coming through town and they want to try out a great selection of basses, I always send them to Steve. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. Consistency among bass lines, consistency among the different products you offer, that's something that Upton Bass excels at. Here are Gary and Eric from Upton Bass on that topic. You know, like continuity of product, which we have fabulous reputation. We've got great product across the marketplace. Do you have seconds? No. Right, yeah, exactly, no. Seconds are in the dumpster. For almost 20 years, Upton Bass has been delivering top-notch bases at every price point, consistency and continuity, like Gary said, across the line. And if the wood's not good, like Eric said, it goes in the dumpster. They are the real deal, made in America. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. It's, it, it seems like such a uh, there's the whole art of the recording studio that's just such a specific and you know uh, different art than actually you know playing on stage in front of humans and I mean it's it's uh, it's I've got a I've got a quest so Martha you were playing off paper for the recording yeah now do you and and I I ask as I sit here holding my iPad Pro I it's seemingly unrelated but it but also kind of related I I remember chatting with Jack in 2017 and he was singing the praises of the iPad Pro. And I, I was just too cheap to buy it for a while, but I think finally, oh, he's got it right there. I finally uh, pulled the trigger, got it, and I'm such a total convert. Um, do our uh, Jack, are you still p- using the iPad Pro for everything? Martha, do you? Are you exclusively paper or? I just got an iPad about a month ago, <laughs> and it's like amazing. I mean, it really because we can play off the score now, and you know, I mean, it, it just some of these pieces were really complicated and trying to play off just a single part and, and figure out how it all fit together was a challenge. And then dealing with page turns when you try to read off the score was almost impossible. So I've, I've converted and it's, it's so much better. It's the, the score thing is so useful. Like I was just playing one of Andres Mar- Martin's uh, pieces, a trio, and to be able to see the score and have all that there. Um, I, I guess the only disadvantage I've found is that, um, well, a small one is like, it, it was unbelievably hard for me to learn how to use the foot pedal. It gave me a whole new respect for harpists or pianists. Like you think all I have to do is tap this thing, but I can't tell you how many times I've like, it's like, oh no, it's too far away. And I left like you know move it around and then i do and i i've even been using it for conducting uh and i i just love having it all there there is something and i remember talking with somebody about it, there's something about you 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 I don't have as much of a sense of where I am in the piece, maybe, because everything's identical. I sort of lose that feeling and the, you know, I like the experience of, of paper, too. There's something about it, but the, the advantages are so many that, that I can't. And I have to remember to put it on airplane mode or some uh, spam caller will call and my music will <laughs> ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to have a little checklist um, when you go out on to play. And even when, when Martha first used the iPad, um, the first time she used it, she used mine on a piece that I wasn't playing on, on a chamber music festival. And so in the margins of the first piece, I wrote in all the, here's all the things you need to do before he you start. Do half page turns, which I just can't. <clears throat> Like, that's too confusing. Yeah, I like the half page turn. So, you can, those that don't know, um, Jason and I have both used the, the app Fourscore, and you can do complete page turns or half page turn. And, uh, and then, so you can see the next line, and you don't have to flip right at the last second. But, um, <laughs> I also notice you're using good notes as well for all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. No, it's, you know, it's funny. Um, the, uh, th- and any other like things I I my checklist it's like okay I got to make sure that I don't have the sleep timer on otherwise my music will go dark when I don't want it to um, if I, yeah the half page turns are a thing um, and just like it, like learning what happens if I I have clicked backwards when I meant to go forwards you know on the on the foot pedal thing and just sort of like learning how to like pedal myself out of disaster um, other than that. 
I even, you know, I, I have started, I have, uh, I've started on a couple gigs just bringing like an iPad stand and not a regular, use, usually I just use a regular music stand, but for chamber music, it's been really cool just having the iPad because it's like, oh, the only space taken up is the music. And I feel like I have a little more eye, eye connection with the mm -hmm. musicians, mm -hmm. eye you contact. Can see the bows better. I mean, there's a lot of. Yeah. 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 Any other any other advice or things to look out for for people or or I guess benefits any anything just because I'm I've you I I credit you Jack with uh, uh, moving me into Maybe the buy a dollar music stand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry yes. about that. <laughs> That's okay. Well, a, a lot of people asking me if I've had any issues with it, and um, and I've had the same same thing where you go to tap tap a page turn and and it goes the wrong direction or something like that, and. And, you know, a lot of people are spooked by that, but I, I usually just counter it with, I can't tell you how many times I've had a problem with paper music, um, you know, turning two pages or not being able to grab the page and get it to turn or having the music blow off the stand. Yeah. Even indoors, I mean, in Texas, the air conditioning can be running so hard, you turn the page and it just turns right back because the air conditioning and, uh, you know, playing in the pit is, is wonderful because instead of using a stand light, it's all backlit on the iPad. It's wonderful. Um, just playing in a in chamber orchestras, I do a lot of that. And playing where it's just one bass, and the parts are laid out as if you have a stand partner, and so there's nowhere for you to drop and you know stop playing and turn the page. Um, I just love playing yeah. off the score. I mean, I had a yeah, rehearsal with a choral ensemble this week, and they sent just the part, and I asked for the score because it's just so much easier to follow. And then, you know, there's not just that stress of, of knowing where you are. And I feel like it cuts down on the, well, maybe not cuts down on the rehearsal time, but frees up the rehearsal time so that you can dig into it a little bit more readily instead of trying to figure out, you know, what where this cello line fits into your part or whatever. You can just see it all laid out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hundred percent agree, and, and and I love also being able. I love reading off the score. I that's so helpful, and I also love not worrying about how much I'm marking up my music because I can always like take it back or turn it off or add another layer. And with conducting, I've even I'll I'll write some things in red, some things in blue, um, send something to my students with the annotations or send it blank. Um, yeah, I've I'm a I'm a huge fan. Uh, the the only the other thing I discovered the hard way was if at least on four score at least last time. I checked if I zoom in at all I then can't turn the page and that has that has messed me up when I've like zoomed in to write something and I know I've been using the iPad a lot because when I play off paper I actually take my fingers on paper <laughs> and make this do you either of you do that and make yeah. the zoom motion pitch to zoom on paper. yeah yeah I have, I have I officially pit yeah so it's incredibly confusing when I read off paper now because I'm trying to like do all my, my iPad motions <laughs> Wow. Who <laughs> knew? <laughs> uh, anything else you want to get out on, on the podcast? Well, the, the album is um, through Albany Records. And so if you want the physical CD, that's, that's the place to go. Um, and the design, the CD booklet design is great. It has all the, the narration in there that's, that I'd recommend to do the read along and um, until we can get a published version with the actual uh, narration recordings. Um, well, we should we should thank the other composers there as well. We mentioned Clearfield and uh, Doherty and a little bit about Tom Knippick's duo. And that's uh, wonderful. It's his third duo. Um, and then the two composers from UT Arlington, George Chave and, and uh, Dan Cavanaugh, that, that also wrote us great pieces. Um, yeah. I'm proud to have a woman composer on the recording. I think she's really incredible, and the work that she's doing is, I think, just extraordinary. I think her writing style is very sensitive to each particular instrument. We we spent a lot of time with her, just over Skype, too, playing stuff, and she was very mm -hmm. open to feedback from us, which is always really satisfying as a player. Mm -hmm. And I think the product um, is just a wonderful piece. We've gotten a lot of great feedback from that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really special. Um, so Andrea Clearfield is based in the Philadelphia area, and she runs a Salon series, which um, we hope to come out at some point and, and play her music there. And uh, speaking of that, we, we have some CD release parties planned. We're going to do one here in, in Arlington, Texas in January. And then I think Ann Arbor, maybe in 
April or sometime in the spring. We haven't set a date for that yet, but we want to go out to Michigan, um, close to Tom Knifik and Michael Dorton and, and uh, do something there in Michigan. So cool. Try to try to get the word out. <laughs> oh, well, actually, um, well, and that's cool. And I'll link up. Are, are you going to put some of that out on your website, Jack? I'll link up to the album and everything. And your, but uh, maybe I'll send people there for that. And a question I, of course, forgot that that I know. I just because people will ask, um, it, how much of this, if any, is published? If somebody wants to play one of these pieces, like is the Doherty published or rental or Tom's pieces? Um, yeah, um, well, we can start with Tom's pieces, which are available through the ISB, mm-hmm. and it's also uh, a way of uh, donating. He's donating the funds to that to the ISB, so uh, you can go to the, the store at the ISB World Office um, website. Michael Doherty's, the, the music, I, I think, I'm not sure if it's available through his website yet, but uh, Volkan Orhan, and I'm sorry, I don't know who the violinist was, but they just played it, which is kind of a, a weird sense for us it's like our little baby that's you know out there in the world now it's got its own life um but, but we just were <clears throat> working a lot with his publisher mm-hmm. on okay now make sure this is right right what did you do here the recording looks different than the music mm-hmm. so we spent quite a bit of time going back and forth with them so i know that's available i just don't know mm-hmm. where yeah I would, I would contact them through michael Bernardi's website to find out uh, Andrea Clearfields is published and available on her website, and uh, Dan Kavanaugh's is available on his website, I believe. If not, um, there's a way to contact him through his website, and uh, the same with George Chave. I haven't seen it available for him, um, but I, I do have a bunch of links that I have saved already that I'll just email to you, Jason, if you want to put them in show notes. And- for sure. Exactly. Well, it's great yeah. to know that so much of that is out there. So that's that's uh, like like I was saying earlier. You know, I, when I started to think about it, I I realized just how little I'd actually played with violin, and it's such a great such a great combo. And it's of course cool to be able to play music with your significant other. What a cool album. I hate to interrupt a moment like that. Don't you wish you could listen to the rest of the album? Oh, wait, you can. Anywhere you get your music, it's there. Uh, Apple Music or Spotify, YouTube, even Amazon Prime, uh, you name it, it's there. Albany Records is the label, so we've got that all linked up in the show notes, and you can also check out these composers we talked about, and if the music's available, we've got that linked up as well. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Martha. I love having people back on multiple times. It's been well, two and a half years or something since we talked to Jack on the podcast, and hopefully we'll do it uh, sooner than that coming up 
uh, in the future. Thank you so much for listening. Maybe this is your first episode. If so, welcome. Maybe this is your 650th or whatever we're on at this point. And if so, thank you for following along or wherever you are in that continuum. Feedback at ContrabasedConversations.com will put you in touch with me. And I love hearing from people and where they're from and how they discovered the show and what they'd like to hear more of. That would be great. Contra Race Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And Mitch just wrapped up a beautiful new base in the Dallas metro area. You can learn more at his website, MitchMooring.com, and all the other things he does. And thank you to Krista Copper for archiving and cataloging everything we do on this show. I just appreciate it so much. And I appreciate you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh-huh.